uh, as we get older, there's just things that proc crop up in our lives we don't expect, uh, but it's just part of dealing with uh, life, and, and uh, so, Lord, we just uh, pray for those who, who are um, uh, at a stage of life where things are happening, and there's no really reason we don't know about, but, Lord, we just pray that uh, you know all the situations, Lord, so we just pray your grace over them, pray your providence over their lives, and, and just uh, uh, let them look to you for the right decisions that they need to make for their health and others around them, Lord. Pray for David and, and Charlotte, Lord, as they uh, go to the hospital. Uh, boy, I tell you, people just drive so crazy so fast that uh, things can happen in a split split minute, and so we just lift them up to you, Lord. There's others that are uh, in our church that are in need of prayer, so we uh, we just lift them up to you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and commune with you through through your word and to, through our, our prayers to you. So thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, we're going to meet tonight and next Wednesday night, and then for July and August, we are, we take off on Wednesday nights um, uh, during those two months. So we'll meet tonight and, tomorrow, and next Wednesday night. <clears throat> uh, that's not going to interrupt our church on Sunday. We still have church on Sunday, but uh, Wednesday nights, uh, we'll, we're, we take a break. Um, I'll be on a mission trip the last part of July and first part of August, and so um, there's a lot of mission trips going on this time of the year, uh, uh, not just here, but everywhere. Uh, uh, people are going, doing things around the world, but here, uh, the guy that leads our Bible study, he, he and his wife are leaving for Costa Rica uh, in about 10 days. I'm not, I don't know, next week, I think. Next week, I think, sometime. And uh, they're taking 30 people with them. They got 10 young, 10 teenagers, which is really exciting. And so, uh, uh, anyway, we'll we'll talk about that. Let's. So tonight, um, I, I just I've been praying about what to do. You know, when we were down in Florida, I did a lot of reading and uh, just quiet. And and I thought, you know, we we uh, the Old Testament is important. Uh, um, I used to not give much attention to the Old Testament, but um, you've heard me say many times the Old Testament is the New Testament uh, concealed, and the Old New Test the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed. So. Um, I think I said that right. I'm not sure, <laughs> but anyway, in the Old Testament. You know, we see Jesus in all the in all 66 books of the Bible, from from Genesis through Revelation, and it's important that we talk about it. So I I got to thinking about the promises and looking at the promises of the Old Testament. So I want to share with you tonight uh, promises, ten promises uh, for us in the Old Testament. And so uh, I've got a if you got haven't got a handout, get one and uh, got some blanks. We're gonna we're gonna fill in, but uh, there's there's lots of promises. That's the first blank. There are lots of promises of God in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, the New Testament. He gives us those, those promises, and, and all of them, he pledges that something, something will or will not be done or given or come to pass. Whatever he gives us, it's going to come to pass. Uh, it will or it won't, it, it might. Uh, but whatever he says, his promises are not casual. That's the next link. They're not. They are written in stone. They are concrete. They are fulfilled. We've seen so many uh, uh, pro prophecies fulfilled, but his promises are rock solid. There's no question they're going to happen. In tw Numbers 23:19, God tells us He never changes. He never changes, and that's because He has said it. He spoke it. I, I, I used to, I don't know if you, I know you've heard this, but years ago there was this the deal that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. It doesn't matter whether we believe it or not. He said it, and it settles it. Uh, it's good that we believe it, but there's so many people that stood on that. But uh, if he said it, that settles it. He is not a liar. His words are truth. Uh, we know that who the father of lies is. That's Satan. And he is very active today. If, if he's not active in your life, uh, as believers, we need to be cautious. Because he is out there looking for that one opportunity to get a foothold in our life. So, um, But the Old Testament and the New Testament tells us that no matter what we go through, no matter what, what storms of life we go through, whether they're health issues or death issues, uh, loss of uh, whatever, no matter what circumstances, we're in the pit uh, of, of life for, for relationships or finances or, or whatever that is. What, no, no matter, no matter what difficulties we go through, God's 
promises will carry us through those, those times of doubt and anxious. He alone is our hope. He alone is our hope. So here's 10 Old Testament promises that God speaks into our lives. Number one, uh, Psalm 108, 13, we have victory over the enemy. There is nothing the enemy can do to us if we are obedient to the Lord, we follow him like he called out his disciples. He has no power over us at all, no authority over us at all, and we have victory over him. Psalm 108, 13 says, with God we will perform valiantly. He will trample our foes. That's the Christian standard. And the NLT says, with God's help we will do mighty things, for he will trample down our foes. We have to ask ourselves, do we believe that? Do, do we have that power? Do we have that authority to walk through and send Satan walking? Get, just get, get away from me. We do. Prior to uh, that, that, uh, ch that chapter 108 there, the, the psalmist, has, he has sought the assurance of God. He has asked God uh, for his presence. So how did he do that? He did that through prayer. Prayer is so important in our lives. Um, uh, you know, I, if, 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 if we're at a point in our walk with Christ and we've never, never seen the power of God move, um, we just have to ask, well, why not? Are, are we not putting ourselves in places where the Holy Spirit is moving, serving somewhere, serving here, serving out in the community somewhere, serving in a food, uh, you know, a soup kitchen? I mean, why have we not seen that? And, 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 and uh, you know, I've had guys, I've shared my testimony uh, in places and, and here before, but but my testimony is, is powerful. It, it, God showed himself to me when he revealed himself to me. And, and after I've given my testimony, I've had some older men in their 80s come to me and say, look, I, I, I never experienced that power in my testimony when I got saved. I would, I, my mom took me to church. My mom and dad took me to church from the time I was a little bitty guy. And, and, and I never saw that power in, in, in me. But he said, I also never heard the word grace or, uh, in a church until about, uh, he said 10 years ago. This one guy said 10 years ago, so I was, he was in his 70s. But God says in 1 Kings, when Elijah was out there on that mountain, and, and Elijah, he was feeling sorry for himself, and God said, go stand out on that, go stand out on that mountain. He said, I'm going to pass by. And, and Elijah did that, and, and then there was this big fire, a big earthquake, and this big wind. And, and Elijah said, well, you weren't in that. And he said, then came that still, small whisper. So God whispers to some people. I, that's just who he is. His word is true. And so, so we, we, praying is so important. Uh, the psalmist knew that there would be victory without, wouldn't be any victory. Would no be, be no victory without God's intervention, about God's intercessory. He prays for us. He intercedes for us. And so the writer of this psalm is telling us that we can be certain. We can know, we can know that we can know that we have the assurance that God will act in his ultimate justice. He is a just God. And he gives us every opportunity. Every opportunity. So no matter what storms, no matter what trials, no matter what difficulties we go through, he is there. Sometimes we feel defeated. Uh, sometimes we feel alone and nobody is listening to us. Nobody is... is we, we're, we're hurt. Uh, we might be confused. But in all that, we can have the certainty, the absolute certainty that of God's promises. He, it, so this psalm is just a powerful reminder that God has the victory. And when we are believers, when we are followers and we're obedient, we, we too have the victory. And so it's in him that we find that victory. So that's number one. Number two is God is always with us. I love the 23rd Psalm and in, in, in verse 4 it says, I fear no danger because you are with me. I, I, you know, I, there's, there's not many uh, memorial services or funerals that I don't cite something about the 23rd Psalm because 
you know, he says, that even you heard me say this, even though you go through the valley of the shadow of death, whatever that is, death, uh, 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 addictions, or, or you, whatever it is, even though I walk through that valley, he says, I'm going to take you to the, to the green pastures. I'm going to take you to the, the cool waters, the quiet waters, the calm waters. I'm going to take you to a much better place. And he said, and I will be with you. I'll be with you. And then as Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, he says, Now this is what the Lord says. The one who created you, Jacob, he's talking to Jacob, and the one who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When God calls us, he, it, it, it's evident. It's evident in our life. It's evident in the change of our life. And so he will call us by our name, and he wants to know us personally. He wants to know us intimately. He knows that. He desires that we, we uh, come to him that way. We receive his spirit. We receive that, that personal knowledge that he already has of us. And he wants, us, wants to have that intimate relationship with us, a personal relationship. He knows everything about us. But God, here's the thing, he says, Jacob, then he says, Israel, well, there was some point in time when, when God gave Israel, uh, he had that name, and then he changed the name to, uh, from Jacob to Israel. Also in that, in that verse 2, there's two things he talks about. He talks about water and he talks about fire. We know that both of those can be dangerous. Many people in the last month or six weeks uh, here in East Texas have seen the dangers of water. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, we were in Florida. We, there were sharks along the, the beach when we were down there, and so uh, we didn't go in there. So water wasn't dangerous, but it could have been dangerous. So water and then fire, we know both of those are dangerous, but they represent chaos and evil. They represent chaos and evil. So that is some sort of personal distress that we might be going through. But the promise is that God is with us. He is with us all the time, no matter what. We just have to realize that and call on him and, and, and believe that. He is with us in our storms and he's with us in our trials. I'll tell you, uh, just before Jesse Blakeney, uh, well, I don't know, the last two or three months, uh, that, that family, Michelle and Shannon and uh, uh, Samantha, uh, and they're some of their friends, they never wavered one time. They knew that time for Jesse was coming. Uh, for many years, they said he wouldn't live past five. He wouldn't live, live past ten. He wouldn't live past. And he was going to be forty in July in August. They stayed right with the Lord. They they just kept believing. God is with us through our storms. Third one is this: all of God's ways are the right ways. Uh, the Rock Deuteronomy thirty two four says the Rock, His work is perfect. All His ways are just. A faithful God, He is righteous. And true. So that's chapter 32. That is the song of Moses. And it just tells us that, that uh, uh, God is good, God is just, and He's righteous. And so five times in that psalm, we see uh, uh, that Jehovah is praised five times in that psalm. And so uh, here again, we see that evil cannot prevail against the righteousness of God. He may, it's like Job. God said, well, he, here's my guy. Here's my guy. You, you, you think he'll follow me when he has distress in his life? Here's my guy. You can do everything you want to, but don't harm him. Don't lay a hand on him. That, we, we might be walking in that same, that same situation, but it cannot prevail. Evil cannot prevail against his might and his power. The reference to the rock tells us we can trust him. He is our rock. We can trust him for our salvation. He can't do anything but good. That, that's what he does. And he is the father we can depend on. Number four is God is our safe place. Whatever you may be going through, run to him. Run to him. That's what, that's what the Blakeneys did. They just, they just kept going to him. Psalm 18, verses 1, 2, and 3 says this, I love you, Lord, my strength. This is David. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock, where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. Why wouldn't we run to that God? Why? The world is, uh, is powerful. It's overpowering, and, and it can snatch those thoughts away from us at any moment. So God is our refuge when we're tired and weary. He's our rock when we are confused. He is our safe haven when we feel lost. And he is our strong tower to run to when we are afraid. He is the one we can always count on. And it takes commitment. And that, that's a process. That doesn't happen overnight. Our salvation, you know, we're told to work out our own salvation. That means we, 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 have, a, uh, we have some responsibility there to, to, to grow ourselves through God's Word and through, through uh, fellowship with other men, other women, uh, just uh, Bible studies. Uh, man, we just, we, we, but, but it's Him. He's the one we count on. And that's a process. It, 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 and so I was 42 when I got saved. Truly, she got saved. And, and it's, it, that goes until the Lord calls me home, whether it's today or, you know, my dad's 95. His dad was 96 when he passed. If I had that long a life, it doesn't matter. We are called to serve until that time comes. So in this song, we just see a lot of metaphors, a large number of metaphors, which is interesting. It's all about the attributes of God's character. And so we don't see another psalm in the entire uh, group of psalms that gives us that many descriptive words about God's character. So he is the only refuge that we have. We can't run to mama. We can't run to daddy. We can't run to anybody else. We can't run to the principal. can't run to the boss. we got to run to him. Him. He is the safe place, and he is the rock that we can stand on. So we, we see things from his perspective. Think about that. What, what perspective does God have? So God is like, he's up there, and he's looking out, and he can see all, everything we do. Like right now, I have the best perspective in the house. I can see all y'all, but this, I'm the only perspective you have right here looking at me. God's perspective, he sees it all. N nothing is hidden from him. And so... Uh, Whatever fears we have, I've had a conversation the last, I don't know, a couple of weeks with some guys. One guy in particular that I'm writing to is in prison. I've never met this guy. And I've written to him for, I don't know, the last five or six months. And, and uh, I was told that he doesn't want to write to me back because he's never met me. He doesn't, he doesn't know what to say. And I said, that's fine. But I told him uh, he, he's supposed to get out pretty soon. And uh, he said he was... Uh, full of anxiety and what all that means. And, and I said, yeah, yeah, sure you are. That's natural. You're, you're not experiencing anything that any other little in inmates in that prison uh, that experienced when they were about to get out. You got here. When you get out here, you'll be full of anxiety. That's called fear. It's fear. They're fearful of what to expect. In there, they are safe. They're safe. But when they come out of there, no matter if they've uh, been in a year or 20 years or 30 years, when they come out, things have changed, and they're, they're fearful of failure. And so we're just, I'm just saying that, that when we see things from God's perspective, our fears, our emotions should fade away into his peace. Jesus said, I, my peace I give to you. Number five, God has our back. Uh, I love this, this verse in Exodus 14, 13, 14. It says, but Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you must be quiet. You must be quiet. He says, don't be afraid. There, there, there are people out there today that are dealing with things that most of us don't even understand. And, and they, they say, well, how, how do I do that? How, how can I not be afraid of this or afraid of that? They're talking about real life applications. How? how? And, and, uh, and so God, God just say, look, don't be afraid. Stand firm for what you believe. 
And folks, if we don't do that today, we, we, we're going to be in a world of hurt. We're, and a lot of people are. He says, see the Lord's salvation. It's, the Lord is the one who gives us salvation. He's the one that gives us the, the mindset and the heart to follow him and obey him and to do follow his commands. And he said, those guys, those Egyptians, those people that are creating chaos in your life, you'll never see them again. If you'll just follow me, you'll stand firm and you'll be bold for what I've called you to do. Just let them go. And that can be hard, too. Um, a lot of guys, even myself, when I came to Christ, um, I lost friends. When I was getting ready to go to Africa in 96. They said, what the crap are you doing? What are you? Hey, man, it wasn't my choice. God, God called me to go there. And so I've got to go. Well, I don't understand that. So, and, and so you end up, you possibly leave friends. But you'll gain a whole bunch more. you gain a whole bunch more. And so... Don't worry about those people. So, and this is the stuff that preachers ought to be preaching. Every, every church, every pastor, every, there's a difference of pastor and preacher, but every preacher ought to be preaching. Don't be afraid. Stand firm for what you believe. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, that, that's always been the deal. Well, it, 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 from the time God said that, to, or Moses said that to those people that God gave to Moses, that's always been the deal. And it's always going to be the word of the Lord tells us that God's on our side. He's for us. And, and the word says, I think it's Romans 8, 31, said, if God is for us, who can be against us? A whole lot. The devil is against us. But we have the power over him. He has no power over us. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, this was our verse during COVID. When COVID hit, this was our church's verse. And, and here's what Paul told Timothy. He said, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. We had, we had to have those things uh, as we went through and experienced COVID. That was our, our verse. So if we look to God for all things, we should have nothing to fear. Our health, my dad is fearful right now because of the health of his wife is poor. And, uh, but he, he can't come to the place where he can say that. And I, I get that. But we really don't have anything to fear. The Bible says that this tent that we live in, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wear out one day. And then we're going to go be with the Lord if we know him. He says, after the body, present from the, from the, uh, with, the, with the Lord. But when we get close to that, I know my dad could be close to that. I know his wife is close to that. Some of our friends are close to that. But God did not give us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. It says to stand firm. Some stand, translations say stand still. So we, there's nothing we can do to help ourselves. Some people think they can, but, but there's nothing. So all this self-help stuff, I, I looked up the word self-help, uh, self-this, self, self at one time. And I think there's over 160 self-plus words. that makes sense? In the dictionary. There's a lot of things about self. We, we can't, in and of ourselves, we can't do anything. But the flesh, the flesh might... Work for us a little while, but it, eventually it will deceive us. The flesh will deceive us. And so our flesh, in order to, to, to understand that God has our back, we must put the control of our flesh into the hands of God. So if, if you ever question uh, your salvation or if you ever question whether God is real or not, th this is a good place to go. Because Moses said, don't be afraid. All those enemies that you have, they have no power over you. If you know Christ as your Savior and if you trust him to, to lead you and guide you through his wisdom. This is the scripture. So if you've ever been mistreated, if you've ever been lied to, if you've ever been bullied, that could describe a lot of us here in this room. This verse should remind us that God will fight our battles for us if we'll just let him. So Exodus 14, 14, it's just a reminder that we need to get close to God. We need to be quiet. He will fight our battles. So how big is your faith? How big is your faith? That's, that's a question we all need to answer. Number six, God cares about our desires. You've heard me. This is one of my favorite verses I uh, learned uh, a long time ago. 
Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He is interested in our desires. And his desire is that we delight in him, that we come to him. We receive his mercy, receive the promise of salvation. Man, there is, that's a great promise. That's a great promise. And our heart desires and our purpose are related in the sense that God's purposes and our desires should match up. They should be the same. And, and guys, look, that, that's work. It, it's like marriage. It's like life. It's work. Every day to fight the, the distractions of the world, uh, to, to, to stay focused uh, on the Lord all through the day. A lot of distractions. But if we're true disciples uh, of, of the Lord, if we truly value God's sovereignty over our lives, if we truly pursue his righteousness, his living, then we can trust him to satisfy our needs. When we get past the, the point where money is, is, is just a tool, uh, it's not, you know, I don't, I'm not greedy. I, 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 you know, I, I, I've been that way at times in my life. But look, uh, I've been offered jobs with seven-figure salaries that, you know, we, I turned down uh, years ago because money is just doesn't, doesn't do it for Paul and I. Everybody needs money. Everybody needs money, but it's a tool. But until we get to that point, we can just set, trust God to satisfy our needs. We're, we're going to struggle. So the key here is this. If we delight ourselves in the Lord, we must connect. We must connect with Jesus Christ. We must have com communion with him through prayer. Prayer is so vital. As you get up in the morning, you start your day. Look, Lord, just here I am. You gave me another day, another day. Time to open, day to open my eyes, and so Lord, lead me, guide me, show me, put people in my path, and help me to recognize that you put them there, and I need to, I need to pay attention. Help me. So when we get to that point, His desires become our desires, and and so we must get close to the Father and seek, seek His heart, because our heart, above all, is deceitful, right? Number seven, we have abundant life in God the Father. Proverbs 8.35 says, For the one who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. So wisdom, wisdom, his wisdom is the key to life now, now, and in eternal life in the future. His wisdom is the key to eternal life. Both are anchored in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. John 10.10, 10, great verse. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it in abundance. Today, not when we get to heaven. We're going to have a lot more abundance when we get to heaven. But today, right here on this earth, Lord, you have come that we can have abundance on life today. Number eight, God desires to have an intimate relationship with us. An intimate relationship with us. So I'm, I, I went to some scriptures here in Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 to 20, and I want to read that. This is about God forgiving uh, Israel's adultery. So here's what it says. Verse 14 says, Therefore, I am going to persuade her, lead her to the wilderness, and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her vineyards back to her and make the valley of Achor into a gateway of hope. There she will respond as she did in the days of her youth, as in the day she came out of the land of Egypt. Verse 16 says, In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, you will call me my husband and no longer call me, call my Baal, call my Baal. For I will remove the name of the Baals from her mouth. They will no longer be remembered by their names. On that day I will make them a co make a covenant for them with the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the creatures that crawl on the ground. I will shatter bow, sword, and weapons of war in the land, and will enable the people to rest securely. I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness, justice, love, and compassion. I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. So this is about the restoration of Israel after their rebellion, after their adultery. So it follows 
the judgment of Israel and the indictment for their sin. You know, time after time, you know, the Israelites rebelled and they sinned against God and they called out to him and asked for forgiveness and he forgave them. And so what happens is God judges them. And so the, their sin not only results in judgment, but here God's covenant promises, his promises result in their restoration through salvation. And so God desires to bring them back, his people, to bring those Israelites close to him in a personal relationship. And so he sort of, y'all have heard this word, woos. So God sort of woos the Israelites back into a relationship with him. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter where we are in life. We're all going to experience things that, that, that uh, could be a trial. No matter what set of circumstances we're in, we can have hope in that relationship with the Father. So that is the real struggle today when, we, when, when I mentor men or, or uh, I talk to people. You know, how does that apply to my life? How do I apply that hope to my life? Because they don't know. They, they, they don't know anything about this book uh, other than maybe what somebody might have told them, and it might be wrong. God desires to have a relationship with him, and it doesn't happen overnight. But we must come face to face with whatever we're dealing with. Uh, got one Christian counselor in our, in our Bible study. He, he deals with men who are dealing primarily with pornography. And, and uh, some of the things he shares with us, it, 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 they, they, they have to come face to face with that sin in order to deal with it. The comfort comes from God's love that came through the cross, his, his redemption, and his hope. And again, the hard, the hard thing is to get these guys to understand this does not happen in this setting, it's a process that you have to make a commitment to time and time again. And that's the hard thing. You know, these guys that come out of prison, they got a target on their back. And, and uh, uh, there are guys who fail. They go back. They recidivate. But there are other men and women who stay the course. Like Paul said, they fight the fight. They, they fight through it. But the hope is in that relationship. And so this, this, this is a reminder that no matter what, God loves us deeply and he loves us passionately. Number nine, God will strengthen us even when we are tired and beat down. Isaiah 58, 10 and 11 says this. It says, and if you offer yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted one, then your light will shine in the darkness and your night will be like noonday. The Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in the parched land, and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden and like a spring whose water never dries, never runs dry. So, so, so what's, he, what's Isaiah telling us? It's a promise for those who are just simply tired and weary. You just run into the, maybe you experience that. You just get, sometimes you just get so down, you just don't feel like doing anything. There's some people who are in such battles for life, uh, for families and individuals. Uh, you just, they're just tired of fighting the, 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 the drudgery of the day. And so what he's telling us though, is for those who are struggling it's hard to find the energy to give of themselves. So I'm saying, what I'm saying is for us, sometimes you get so tired and you just say, man, I just can't, I can't do that. And, and it's only through God's, God's love and understanding that he's the one who gives us strength to just catch another gear. It's when there's a need to get in your car and go to the hospital or get in your car and go down to Billy's or get in your car and stop and talk to that gal in the corner or, or, or take somebody into McDonald's and buy them a hamburger or something. God's the one that supplies that strength for us. In and of ourselves, we, we just can't do it. He gives us the energy. And so these verses translate into righteous action. God's the one that called us to action. He's the one that does it. We don't do it. Listen, uh, last year when I went to Alaska and I walked up down that riverbank with those 1,000, 1,200 people in that, wa in that water fishing for those, those salmon, I was scared to death. Here's all these people, and, and, and they're going to pull those fish out of the water. And you, that's when you, you can't go in the water with them. That's the law. But, but when they come out, and they're standing there, and they're cleaning those, 
You just got to go up and, 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 and let God do that. It, 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 let him speak for you to create some sort of, 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 of conversation so that you can ask the question. Talk to him about Jesus. It's him. It's, it, it, we must get out of these chairs and go outside and, and act. He tells us, he commands us to go. And so it tells us that we drag ourselves out of the ditch. If we can pull ourselves up with the bootstraps to help others and to satisfy the desires of those in need, then even when we might be in our own desert, God promises to make us like a spring whose water never runs dry. The living water never runs dry. Let me tell you how Sunday morning uh, I was waiting for the surgeon to come into my dad's room. And after he came in and we talked, I told my dad, I said, I'm going to go. Uh, I, need, I need to go to something to eat. I hadn't eaten since, I, since noon the, the next day before. And, and uh, so I go downstairs. There's nobody in the hospital. This big hospital in Richmond, nobody in the hospital. So I go down to the main floor, and I'm looking for the, you know, the index. that tells you what, where all the doctors are and all the rooms in the cafe or whatever it is. And I'm standing there, and so there's a nurse sitting in a chair about, about by, the, by the back door there. And uh, she's on her phone. And, and I'm looking, and I hear a noise. I hear the door open. I look down about where Erica is. There's a guy coming in the door. And so I just kind of glanced at him. I look back at the deal, and I turn to walk off. Well, I hear this guy start screaming. I mean, screaming some ugly, nasty words. And I kind of get the impression he's talking to me, but I just kept walking in pace because there's some stairs. I'm going to hit the stairs. He gets closer and closer, just cussing up a storm. And he got about me to Dino, and I said, hey, man, are you talking to me? He goes, more descriptive words. I said, are you talking to me? And I said, man, are you all right? Are you all right? Can I help you? And he just kept, I don't know, and I said, can I pray for you? That made him even madder. <laughs> so I just stepped up the stairs and went. But I, I, you know, th th this, this guy, uh, th th that could have gone south in a hurry. And I was prepared to hightail it. Because I left my gun in the car trying to follow all the rules of the hospital, you know. But, um, guys, it, it, God does that. I, I, that, ain't, that ain't me. That ain't you. God, God gives us discernment. There's times when we stay, and, and, and if, if, if that guy would have said, hey, yeah, would you pray for me? I'd have done that with my eyes open. But, you know, guys, we just we have to be careful. But, but God does that. It, he, that water in us never runs dry. He is faithful. So God's promise is that when we feel empty, when we pour ourselves into others, when God's going to do some miraculous things in us, and later on you're going to walk away and you're going to go, wow. Wow. I was talking to C.R. Chapman. He's a pastor over at Ben Wheeler Cowboy Church, and he just got back uh, Monday from camp with their kids up in Oklahoma. Camp Wow. Camp Wow means walk on water. I didn't know that until he told me that. God's going to fill us up. He's going to give us that everlasting abundance to, of his living water to keep us going every day. I don't, I don't like it. When, when men tell me that, uh, hey, I've served my time. I've done my duty. I, I'm, I'm done. Well, that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. They don't get it. There ain't no, there ain't no retirement in, in the Lord's work. Number 10, God's words are true. Second Samuel seven twenty eight said, David said, Lord God, you are God. Your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. So that's just a, it's just a promise that God's promises are true. What else can you say? This is pretty interesting, though, when I was doing the research on this. David knew. He knew that God's words are true. Now, you know David, he, he didn't done all that stuff. Um, but the Hebrew, Hebrew word trans, uh, related to the word true is amen. We know that when we, when we say amen, we, we're saying, yeah, that's true. That, that, amen, amen. I thought that was pretty. That's just an affirmation. Of God's word, it, it being true. There's a guy on, uh, um, I don't know what channel he's on, but uh, radio, when I go down the road, sometimes I listen to him. And he goes, uh, something like, the conversations on this radio station are, are true. They cannot be broken. 
that's the way God's word is. His word is true, and no matter what anybody says, it, it, his word is the word. It, is, it can't be broken. So if God, it was God's truth that provided David with the foundation. The foundation. Every one of us, no matter what business we've been in in our lives, no matter what, what, no matter what, all of us need a foundation. And for the believer, it is number one, it is salvation. It is that relationship with Christ. And that's, that's God's promise. And he desires to have that relationship with us. So there's uh, just something a little different, guys. I